Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you so much for the opportunity to have to be here, the opportunity to, uh, again, love and honor and adore you. Father, we just pray that everything we do today is pleasing to you. Father, just strengthen us now, be with us in, in and about this time as we give it to you. We pray this in your Son's name. Amen. The mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Isaiah 2 2.
Amazing Racer, one character named Max, named Max, states, I am going to grab as much life as I can as long as I can. In response, the second character replies, it's how you live your life that counts. Max lived a life that was spiritually asleep. Much of the world embraces this philosophy, and over 6,300 people die every hour around the world. How many of these will die without Jesus? God speaks of the prophets of Israel who were spiritually asleep. Though all the warning signs were there, these men of God ignored them and failed to warn the people of the judgment that was coming. Oh, there were a few godly prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah, but for the most part, the watchmen were asleep and numb to the fact that the people of God were on a path headed for destruction. In Psalm 17, David prays to God to probe his heart, to examine and test him. In this psalm, David was going through a tough time. He was praying to God for help from his enemies. David was confident in the midst of his testing. He would be vindicated by God and judged to be walking the path of God. David ends the psalm by telling God, When I awake, I will be satisfied with seeing your likeness. Waking up means being satisfied with seeing the likeness of God. Satisfied with seeing reality as it really is. Being spiritually awake, alive, leads to being viable and useful for God's purposes. What does Jesus say on the matter? Shortly before the last Passover meal with his disciples, Jesus taught his disciples about the second coming in Mark 13. Toward the end of his speech, he mentions that no one knows that day or that hour when he will return, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Then he warns them three times in the next five verses, stay awake, since they couldn't know when Jesus would return. He concludes, and what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Notice that in this passage, Jesus uses the phrase, stay awake three times. I think he's trying to tell us something. A couple of days later, he shared his last meal with the disciples. That night, he went to Gethsemane to pray before his betrayal. Jesus was anguished by the cup of suffering he was about to drink. He took his inner circle of disciples, Peter, James, and John, with him, and told them to remain here and watch. Then while Jesus was in agonizing prayer, his closest companions couldn't stay away. Just a few days earlier, they received Jesus' empathetic warning to stay awake, and now they were falling asleep. Three times, Jesus returned from praying to find his disciples falling asleep. Three times, Jesus said, stay awake. Three times, his disciples fell asleep. Have we too missed Jesus most empathetic exhortations. With disappointment, he asked them, could you not watch one hour? Then he warned them, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, the flesh is weak. Mark captures the fact that the failure of the disciples to hear and obey Jesus' teaching to stay awake. Stay awake. Of course, Jesus was talking more than just avoiding falling asleep when we pray. He was giving instruction about spiritual awareness. With the repetitive command to stay awake, Jesus spoke to all of his disciples throughout the ages about the need to remain alert. I think for us it would become easy to lose our spiritual edge and focus. It doesn't take much to lapse into a spiritual desensitization because of the pseudo-comforting distortions and distractions around us. Staying awake spiritually involves looking past the clamor of worldly attractions. It's about perceiving the presence of the kingdom of heaven, growing up like wheat among the tares of a modern society. Are you remaining aware, staying awake in the ongoing revealing of the kingdom and the imminent coming of our Lord? Being spiritually asleep means that while we have eyes, we do not really see. While we have ears, we do not really hear. And while we were physically here, we are not really present. 
We need to read scripture with our minds, our hearts, with our eyes and our ears. Jesus said it so often, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. If we are to stay awake in the midst of the world of spiritual stupor, then we need to be diligent in prayer. No wonder Paul advised us to pray without ceasing. If sleep meant physical death in 1 Corinthians 11.30, then those who had physically died would have already been condemned with the world having physically died as a result of sin. And an appropriate interpretation would be that Paul is telling them of their spiritual condition, spiritually asleep. So whether 1 Corinthians 11.30 is speaking about the physical or spiritual, both are negative consequences to sinful activity. While there are some implications to be made as a result of whether this text is speaking about physical or spiritual, the bottom line remains the same. The point of Paul's admonition is to encourage the church to be right with God and to realize the error of their ways so that they will avoid eternal torment and do not be condemned to the world. Jesus suffered and died for his sins as we remember his shed blood and his broken body. Jesus paid it all that you might be a willing servant, ever seeking God's will. So as you sit and prepare to take communion, may your prayer to the Lord God be, help me see the ways which I may be spiritually asleep. Create in me a deeper, richer, and a yearning for you, Lord.
thank you that you sent your son so many years ago to die on the cross for us, to take our sins so that we can be with you. Please bless this communion as we take it to remembrance. In your son's precious name we pray.
Bow our heads in prayer, please. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we have gathered here today. This is the time of the year that we celebrate the birth of your son. It's a festival celebrating a birthday. And that celebration, Lord, is a season of giving. We never must forget what we need to give to you. But we know that as we give to different charities, it is a blessing. But today we give to you, back to you, with an open, cheerful heart. We ask you, Lord, to bless this offering. In your son's name, amen. <coughs>
see how they do today when they come back in. And then we're all closed. <laughs> uh, today we're going to talk about um, pure heart. We come into the holiday season and, and we get ready to uh, witness once again the birth of Christ and celebrate that. Um, we want to look at what it took to get Jesus here. Uh, Mary had a pure heart. Joseph had a pure heart. What is, what is a pure heart? And the question is, do you have one? So we'll look at that today. Here's um, some of the things that are said. Um, Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Who is pure in heart? Only those who have surrendered their hearts completely to Jesus, that He may reign in them alone. Only those whose hearts are undefiled by their own evil and by their own virtues. Diedrich Bonhoeffer. When people attempt to live double life spiritually, that is, to appear, to appear pure on the outside, but not pure in the heart, they are anything but blessed. Their conflicting loyalties make them wretched, confused, and tense. And having to keep their eyes on two masters at once make them cross-eyed. And their vision is so blurred that neither image is clear in them. Clarence George. Opposing purity of heart is lust of any kind for wealth, for recognition, for vengeance, for sexual access to others, whether indulged through action or imagination. Jim Forrest. A pure will loves God with the whole heart and soul and mind. It is fanatical. The greatest insult the modern mind can conceive and the greatest compliment God can give. It is also the greatest compliment a lover can give. I love you with all my with my whole heart and soul. My love is not divided. You have no rival. Peter Kreef. There is an interaction between seeing and being. The kind of person you are affects the kind of world that you see, and conversely, what you see affects who you are. To see God in terms of the Beatitudes promise, it is to be able to stand before Him, God, accepted into His presence at the last judgment. So a pure heart, a pure heart is what? All these people talk about it, they tell you about it, what it takes to have it, it, it takes living for God and God alone. Nothing else takes precedent. <coughs> Nothing else is important. As I said, I love you with all my heart and soul. You have no rival. There's nothing else there. It's just you. It's you and me, God. Nothing else gets in the way. Not Black Friday. Not Cyber Monday. Not all these things that we think Christmas is, but it's you alone, God. Our thoughts turn to an angel child lying in the manger. I mean, this time of year, we, we look at it and we see Jesus as this, as this baby who was born in the lowest of manners, in a stable, laying in a feed trough with some hay and a blanket. And yet, how magnificent is that birth? How life-changing. You're sitting here today because you were changed by that birth. Without it, what hope do we have? Without that birth, how many of you sit here today? You don't. 
And so today I'm going to tell you, you're sitting here today because you are striving for the pure heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And what a saying, huh? Some other scriptures that we have in the Bible that touch on the subject that you can uh, jot down, take note. Uh, I don't want to wait on each one for you to look them up. The main one is um, found there in Matthew 5, 8. That we're going to be looking at. But Psalms 24, 4 says, The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by any false god. Psalms 51.10 Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Psalm 73.1 Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Psalm 73.13 Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. Proverbs 20, verse 9. Who can say I have kept my heart pure? I am clean and without sin. Proverbs 22, 11. One who loves a pure heart and who speaks with grace will have the king as a friend. 1 <coughs> Timothy 1, 5. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Timothy <coughs> 2 2.22 Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure <coughs> heart. Over and over and over again, the Bible speaks about this pure heart. Having this kind of pure heart that you can see God. Having this kind of pure heart that you can call on Him. Having this kind of pure heart that Life does not get in the way. How many of you has life ever gotten in the way? How many of you desire the pure heart? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, when they're talking that, they're not talking seeing God today. When they talk that, they're talking about seeing God in the end. But it also talks about seeing God. We can see God if, if we're blessed, can we not? Can we not see God in our in our homes? Can we not see God in our families? Can we not see God as we look at ourselves and as we have become more like Him daily? We, we can see images of Him, but we don't see the physical Him until that day. Can you imagine it? Enter in the good and faithful servant, Jesus says, and you enter in and you see Him in all His glory as He is there. That, that image, that, that, can you imagine? I mean, we know about people who hear it that have seen Him, right? Moses saw Him, right? What did it do to Moses? Changed him. Turned his hair white. Made him, when he, when he came down from the mountain, what, did, what happened? It, he glowed. glowed. He just, you know, because he was in the presence of God. I mean, imagine how we will be changed when we walk into that gate and we see God as He is. As we're in that place of heaven that He has built for us. Because we were pure in heart. Here's what we're, here's what we're talking today. It's much like uh, an interview. Anyone ever been on an interview? They ask you questions. Uh, going to Kentucky, Kentucky Christian College, they, they sent us a, a interview page. And on that page, it was actually several pages, they asked us questions. And we had to answer those questions in an essay form. 
And by looking at those questions, they determined whether or not they would allow you in to the college. To be in a private institution, they, they could allow or deny as they wanted to. And some of their questions went like this. What will you do after you gain admission into the college? Smart Aki High School kid, what do you mean, what am I going to do? I'm going to get an education. <laughs> Is get an education an essay? I thought it was. <laughs> some, people, some students would, I will endeavor to gain the best education that I can. Well, what will you do after you have earned your degree? Get a job. <laughs> and after that, after that, what do you do after that? Retire. Earn money. How many of you got a job to earn money? How many of you got a job to work for free? Just check it. Then they said, well, we're going to do it after college. We're going to make it. Money. Some of us make a good deal of money. Some of us don't make a great deal of money. Depending on the church you're at, a size church or a different place like that, he says, and then after that, what will you do? What do you do after you make a great deal of money or, or make money or have money? You retire. You retire. Some of us retire and lucky enough to retire to Florida, at least part-time, but you retire. They said, and then after retirement, what? After retirement, what? Did you babysit? Yeah. It's interesting to note that on most college papers, if they were asked to, ask, they, to answer these questions, when they said an after retirement what? People left the blank. Just left the blank. They didn't know. <coughs> they thought in life it was go to college, get a job, earn lots of money, retire, and live the happy life. They thought planning for the future was that. We as Christians know that planning for the future is beyond that, isn't it? We start off when we accept Christ our Lord and Savior to plan for our future, and our future is where? Heaven. How much money in that job that you had gets you there? What does it take to plan your retirement in heaven? Faith in Jesus. If you were in Sunday school, you learned two words. Hopefully you learned two words when you're studying up to Faith and obedience. In, in order to prepare for, for our eternity, our retirement in eternity, it's going to take faith and obedience. <clears throat> if we have faith in God and obedient to Him, Scripture tells us we will have a pure heart. Now, can you make your heart pure? No. Read it. Here, after these kids were, were taking their little thing, taking their talk, like I did mine, they didn't plan for eternity. They planned for this life. Scripture says their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on mere earthly Things. Philippians 3.19. That's where a lot of us are. A lot of us were there. I was there. When I filled out my form for college, I was a Christian, but I was there. What are you going to do? Get an education. What are you going to do with the education? Get a job. What are you do with the job? Make money. What are you do with that money? Save for retirement. My, mine wasn't much different than theirs. I, I thought I would make Big money. I'm working for God. He not only owns the cattle and all the hills, He owns the hills. What does it mean to be rich in God? 
Say it out loud, Judy. You said it. Happy. How many of you are happy in God? How many of you have your needs taken care of? How many of you have a roof over your head, food in your belly, and clothes on your back? Thank goodness. We have that. That's what our needs are. So how many of you are happy in God? He supplied all that. I know He supplied that. I know I could very easily be unemployed. I know that I could very easily... But God supplies and takes care of. He has blessed us beyond most of our means, has He not? So you look at it and say, gosh, how is that? Faith and obedience. Because of faith and obedience, God blesses us. Part of His blessing is that someday we will see Him face to face. Today we see Him in our actions and our things and the way He blesses us. We see those things. And He goes through there. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see, they shall see God. And that, that's what I want. How do you get it? Keep asking the question. How do you get it? Here it is. Number one, living by the rule of God. Living life that is pleasing to God. How many of you live by the rule of God? Now you're okay. You're okay if you do this. <laughs> half. Can't say half. I live by the rule of God the best I can, but the rule of Tracy takes over sometimes. You know that rule? Yep. The rule of life. Get what you can get while you're here. That takes over sometimes, doesn't it? Sometimes we're not happy with what we need. We want what we want. How many of you, your wants drive you? They, they push you to... You know what my biggest want is? I can, I, can, I can honestly say this. My biggest want... Heaven. I, I want certain things in this life. Those are things that... But my biggest is heaven. I really worry sometimes that I'm not going to get there. Because I, I know sometimes that my heart isn't so pure. I know sometimes we make sure that this <coughs> looks good. We, we make sure that what people see and perceive is good. But that isn't what they're talking about here. They're talking about the heart. Who sees the heart? God. And sometimes that worries me. Because it's the heart is where we live. It's the heart that, that really makes us who we are. And I know sometimes in my heart are not those things that are so pure. Because I'm human, I, I have these desires of life. You know, ever want a new car? Ever want something? I mean, for the longest time, I, I had this TV. And I, and I wanted this TV. <laughs> and, and you can ask my wife. For years, it was always like, we would go into Sears somewhere, and I'd be kind of like, you see him over there? You don't dare go there, right? It's like, and I remember one year we went there. She says, you know, I got this teacher in front of school that's working part-time at Sears and can get us a discount. We can go look. There's no looking. We can go buy or we can not go. That was the choices that night. We will buy or we don't go. We went. I have that big TV. It sits in my living room. It fills up the whole fireplace here. You know what I want? Can you imagine that in your house? <laughs> you guys are, we show the Super Bowl here. Football on the screen is, is real life. You can almost go there and hit the players. We have wants, don't we? It's not a need. It's not. I don't need that. I don't need the TV I have. 
But we have these wants, and sometimes those wants take over, don't they? And you know what I'm talking about. Your want may not be that TV, but it's something. <clears throat> but if we're pure at heart, Scripture tells us, we are content where we are. Are you content where you are? Are you content with God? Do you know Him and He knows you? Or do you have that worry I have sometimes that I'm not going to make it? And I know this, that if I have that worry sometimes that I'm not going to make it, you've had that worry. You've asked the question, am I doing enough? I asked the question, can you ever do enough? Because sometimes we want to do enough to, to get by, right? That's not what this pure heart is. Blessed are the pure heart. Go to the Beatitudes and read the Beatitudes. That's where that comes from. Read those. Are you those things? Are you what all those things say? I mean, go there, Matthew, and, and look those up and, and look what they are. You know, blessed are the meek. Are you meek? Go through those lists and see what you are. Because pure in heart adds up to a lot of different things. The biggest is living by the rule of God, living a life that is pleasing to Him. And I have to ask myself every day, did I please God? When I lay down in bed, it goes through my mind. Did I please God today? Did I do what He wanted me to do today? You know, I shared with you a couple weeks ago that I had a prime opportunity buying them turkeys in the store and talking to that, and I passed it up. That night I said, would I do what God would do? Did I live pleasing? I don't think so that day. And every day I have to look at it, every day I have to go through it. Did I? Did I today live with a pure heart? Did I keep my thoughts in check where they should be? Were my actions what God would expect from me? Did life today glorify Him? The second thing that you have to do is living for the purpose of God. Having a single minded devotion to God. What does it mean to live by the purpose of God? Everything I think, everything I say, everything I do glorifies Him. Would you live that way today? That's what it's about. But when they said earlier that nothing else is important, only God. God takes precedent over wife. God takes precedent over kids. God takes precedent over work. God is the precedent that you live by. And if God is the precedent that you live by, then marriage is fine. Kids are fine. Work is fine. Family is fine because you're doing it by Him. How many of you work for God? What do you do? Stacy, what do you do for a living? Nurse. Robert, what do you do? At the gas pumps. Cindy, what do you do? Healthcare administration. Joe, what do you do? Contractor. Contractor. And yet you work for God. What does that mean? Be the example. You be the best. Stacy is the best nurse on her floor. <coughs> Always. Robin is the best pump attendant they have over there. Oh, no, you are. <laughs> I can attest to it. You're, you're friendly and everything else. Some of those other ones aren't. You have never yelled at me when I left my truck parked at the pump and went to the store. And that other guy, man, he gives me grief. Hey, 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 you parked the pump. Do you know who I am? <laughs> 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 
That's not living by God's precept, is it? No. But we think that sometimes, don't we? Is what you're doing for God? And if it is, it's to the best. It's because we are faithful and obedient and have that pure heart. Did you read? Did you catch the one verse that I read? The one verse up there in uh, Psalms 51:10. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. You know that song? You know how it goes? Create in me a clean heart, O oh my God. And, and what? <laughs> and renew a spirit within me. You know what that song is? You know what that psalm is? It's a psalm. It's a song. When we sing it, we're what? Pray. When they wrote that, that's a prayer. Created me a clean heart. It means I don't have it. I do not have that pure heart, but God created me. How does He do that? It begins with knowing Him. And for those of you in here that understand the difference, you'll know this. Knowing Him is so much different than knowing of Him. Just like living is so much different than living for Him. We have to know God. And when we come to know God, God will work through us. I mean, we talked in Sunday school, we talked the last few weeks on, on characters in the Bible, and, and we started with, with a couple that the book had with Abraham and something like that, and we went to the main one, Jesus. And here, here's, the, here's the line, here, here's where we want to be, Jesus. Here's how he lived his life. And then we're looking at these other characters who are down here flopping around, who kind of get a kind of knock but who are used by God for good. So that people like Moses and, and Daniel and ones we're looking at can be what they were. You see, we have a standard that has been set for us to live. And in order to reach that standard, we have to accept the standard. How many of you accept Jesus Christ and His way of life? We do. And if we accept that, then we have to have the goal of living like that. You want to see a pure heart? Look at Jesus. Look at His life. Look at His testament as He dealt and intermingled with people and how He dealt with them and what He did. You know, how harshly could He have, cre have treated some people in their sin? And yet, how did he treat them? The, the things that he did in his life were an example for us to, to, to see and to know how we could live with that kind of pure heart. <clears throat> and he showed us that that kind of pure heart is those two things that we're talking about. Living by the rule of God. Living a life that is pleasing to God. By living by the rule, we're going to live a life that's pleasing to Him and by living for the purpose of God. What's His purpose for me? Why does He have me being a nurse in this hospital at this time? It's more than serving the patients. It's more than just the health care. It's more than administrating over. It's more than just being a contract for you're going to come in contact with people and those people need what? Jesus. It's how you approach that job. When that person comes to the pump having a bad day, you can make it or break it, can't you? 
when you're a contractor and you're there and you come to these people that you don't know but you're coming into their house to do a job for them, you can make or break it when it comes to Christ. Of how you handle yourself, how you speak, how you charge, how you do the things that you do. It'll make or break it. And it's whether or not you have the pure heart to be on this standard or not. I have a pure heart sometimes. My goal is daily to have a purer heart than I had the day before. My goal this next year is to be better than I was this year. To strive to be more like Him to have that kind of heart that He had for people, for ministry, for, for what He lived for. Jesus lived for one purpose and one purpose alone. God and His will. And we saw that. I say it all the time. Not my will, yours be done. It's not about us. It's about Him. It's about us being the vessel He can use, like Mary, like Joseph, to bring about What can God do through you, you who has the pure heart, who has the mind of Christ, who has the ability and the want of heaven? What can God do through you if we would but turn it all over? Peter Brown always said it. It's about totally giving yourself up that Christ. Paul says, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. It's, it's that simple. The hard part is giving it all up, isn't it? The hard part is being satisfied where we are. The hard part is living for Him and not for us. And if you want a pure heart, it starts with faith. It extends to obedience. That faith and obedience will lead us to living the life by God's rules, by His desires, to living for the purpose of God, for Him alone, to do His will and His work. That's a pure heart. And blessed are those who have a pure heart, for they shall see God. Not just on that final day, enter in or depart from me, but throughout life you'll see Him. And the people and in actions and in all that around you. I mean, that's our goal, is it not? To daily see God in us and our lives. When you look in the mirror, to see more like Him than you are yourself, to be His. Is the Lord. But we're going to stand and we're going to sing a hymn of the invitation. An opportunity for you to look at yourself. Answer the question Am I pure in heart? <clears throat> if it's yes, always, all the time, praise God. If it's yes, a lot of time, great. If it's yes, some of the time, good. But until we can say yes all the time, we have work to be done. So, if you're here this morning, you've never given your life to Christ, you have no idea what this pure heart is until you get it. And that pure heart only comes through acceptance of Jesus Christ. That pure heart only comes through giving of yourself and being His, being washed in His blood. Being buried with Him in baptism and raised to live that new life that we live. That life for Him. If you're here this morning and you've given your life to Christ, you at one point said that, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me, and you've taken back the reins of that. I bet sometimes you're still in control. This morning, it's time to get that pure heart, that absolute pure heart, to say, God, here's all. Everything I got, here it is. 
take it, use it, use me as you see fit. Give me that pure heart that I can see you in all things that I do. If you have a decision to make this morning, I understand that you see make your decision. change us, that you'll give us that pure heart that when people see us, they see you. When people hear us, they hear you. Father, that we can show you through all things that we do. Father, guide us this week and give us someone that we can speak to for you. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.